chapter 2. And we're going to start reading in verse 9. And Luke chapter 2, in verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And you sh this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made note unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at the, those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. The title of this message today is The True Way of Keeping Christmas. From Luke chapter 2, verses 9 through 20. The True Way of cre Keeping Christmas. You know... Christmas is almost here, it's just a few days away, Friday will be Christmas Day, and we are all looking forward to it, it's an exciting time, the children look forward to Christmas, and, and I suppose most adults look forward to Christmas, we get to do something new at the house, and decorate, and, and the cook bake certain things that we don't normally bake, and eat certain things we don't normally eat, and, and we even get to uh, see family and friends that we don't normally get to see, and it's just a nice time, you get a little time off from work, and we have uh, traditions that we keep during Christmas time, and so you get to you look forward to the certain things that are done in your home or in your family uh, each Christmas time. And for some of us are starting new traditions, so we're we're beginning to have uh, uh, our our first Christmas tree in the house, and that's exciting. We have the first uh, time that well, some people are having a baby's first Christmas. You get the little Christmas ornament, put that on your Christmas tree. Just things are exciting and different, and 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 interesting. And, you know, the world is, uh, has a very powerful influence upon us, and, and they like Christmas too, but they, the world doesn't really like Jesus. Uh, they like Christmas, which is the day in which we celebrate the birth of Christ, but they're not big on Jesus, and that should be apparent to us as Christians that they do not want us to speak in Jesus' name or preach the gospel, but they do like Christmas. And, and I suppose that's just part of our culture. We like Christmas. We like all the colors, the lights, the decorations, the shopping, and the gifts. And, and there's lots to Christmas that's exciting, but the world's not big on Jesus. So we want to talk about the true way of keeping Christmas so we can examine the way that we worship our Lord, and we can divide the worldliness from the godliness, and we can make sure we're scripturally based in what we do, and, and we, can, we can worship our God with a good conscience so that the world's not influencing our Christmas time. Of all the times, we don't want the world to influence us. It'd be Christmas time when we're worshiping on the day that we're celebrating the birth of our Savior. So let's talk this morning from this passage of Scripture, things to avoid. First of all, things to avoid. Now, the first thing you want to avoid in, in Christmas time and the true way of keeping Christmas, you want to avoid irreverence. You know, we, speak, we look here and we see that it says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. They're speaking to the shepherds. In, the, in that country, there were shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And they were just out there watching the, ship, watching the sheep, and, and they were working their evening shift, and, and the angel shows up. And he has a great announcement. And he says unto them, uh, he says unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. You know, the angel came to announce the birth of our Savior. And what does that tell us? It tells us this is a very important event. It tells us that Christmas, the time in which we celebrate the birth of Christ, is a very important event. The angel was sent to announce the birth of Christ because it's an important event. It's a reverential event moment. You know, it's a solemn occasion to think that God himself exited heaven and he visited earth. Now anytime there would be a visitation from heaven, whether it's an angel or whether it's God himself, it's going to be a big event. But this was the event of all events. God had 
spoken to men in the past. He had visited, he spoke to Ab uh, uh, Moses in the burning bush. He came and he spoke to Abraham before he went to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he had spoken to other people through the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, we see that Christ had visited and spoken to Paul on the, on the road to uh, Emmaus as he was, uh, excuse me, on the way to Damascus as he was going there. Uh, and God spoke to him and he was converted at that time. But this time wasn't just God coming for a brief moment. It wasn't just... The, the, the Lord himself visiting a man and having conversation with him. This time, God himself left heaven and took on the form of a man and was born as a little child and lived for 33 years on this earth and walked and talked among us. And he showed himself and he showed the glory of the Father and he showed the love of God and he demonstrated and he lived uh, what it was like to be Christ, the, the Savior, the Messiah. He showed us God. And so this is no small event. This is no small event. This is a big event. God has come to earth. Now, we could pass the day off as just a, a day off from work. Uh, just, we could pass the day as just a uh, time to visit with friends and neighbors. But this is really the day in which the Savior came. This is the day in which Jesus Christ, God of heaven, creator of all things, exited heaven where he was in the utmost blessedness, where he was in the utmost of comfort, whether he was in the perfect communion with his heavenly Father in the full presence of his glory. And he exited heaven and took on the form of a man and humbled himself and became as a servant. And he became a man. And he was the God-man walking to, uh, uh, with us. You know, it's the greatest news. The, the, the men of the Old Testament, they anxiously, an anxiously awaited the time of the coming Messiah. They looked for him. Every sacrifice and offering was a reminder to them that one was coming who was going to take away the sins of the world. And there was going to be somebody who was going to come and was going to redeem them and, and perfect them. And so they looked for it. They longed for it all the way back to the Garden of Eden when, the Father, when God said to Adam and to Eve that there would be one who would come who would be born from the, of, of a woman, the seed of a woman and he would... Uh, his heel would be bruised by the serpent, but, but um, he would bruise that serpent's head. There was, there was this longing and expectation that someone would come. And you know, it's not just the people who had the Bible. Did you know that in mo many religious cultures of the day, they had an expectation of a coming Messiah? They had an expectation that somebody was going to come and that he would come and that he would be born and he would be born of a virgin and that he would come and save the world. That's not, a, that's not unique to Christianity. It wasn't unique to the Jews, but why is that? Why is it that they have this unusual correlation between our coming Messiah and, the, uh, this, and, and, and some Savior that was going to come and, and save the world? Why is it that they had such a relationship to the Bible and, and these other religions? It's because other religions started when people left the, the place where true religion had started, Garden of Eden, and then with the flood, there was Noah and his family, and, and they passed this truth down, and then man began to uh, prolificate across the earth, and he began to spread, and so religions began to emerge and began to depart from truth, but retain some of it. And so they were looking for a coming Messiah, and here come three wise men. They saw his star in the east. What did they see? They recognized that his star meant that the Messiah had been born. The long-awaited one had come, and they came as a delegation to come and check him out and see who this, see the Messiah that had come, the one they had waited for. They weren't even practicing Jews. They were somewhere in the east. But there were other religions expecting a Messiah. Where did they get that? They got that from God when he told them that one would come and deliver. All the ancient people of the world were looking forward to this day. This is a big day. This is a really big day. Christmas is a big day. Now, people say, well, Christmas wasn't the actual day when Jesus was born. And whether it was or whether it wasn't, it really doesn't matter. Because, you know, if you get adopted into a family and they don't know the day of your birth and they just make up a day and say, this is going to be the day when we celebrate your birth, that's okay. We'll take that. And if somebody says, well, that was the day that they celebrated something else on that day, it doesn't matter as long as we celebrate your birthday on that day. That's what matters most, that, that it's done for you. And so do this for Christ. Don't do it for the world. Don't do it for something, uh, something else. Do it for Christ and say, well, this is the day that we're going to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Right. It doesn't matter who celebrated what on this day. We're not going to participate in any sort of uh, foolishness 
that would be part of some other paganism. We just want to celebrate Christ. And we want to thank God that He came into the world. Amen. That's what Christmas is, remembering that Jesus Christ came into this world because I'm a sinner and I needed a Savior. And there was a long, long expectation for this day. It's a big day. Christmas is a big day. They've been waiting for this day, looking for this day. And the ancient people wondered when would they come. And every Jewish woman wondered, maybe I'll be the one. Maybe before they were married and before they had children, they would wonder, maybe God would pick me. And he'd let me bring in the Messiah. And they, every Jewish woman would wonder if her, her, her womb would bear the Messiah. And so, it's such an expectation. And so, for centuries they expected him. And now, the day has come. He came to the earth. He was born. And he lived. And he died. And it's one of the two greatest days in the history of the world. One of the two greatest days in the history of the world. The first being that uh, day in which he uh, came to the earth, the Christmas, and that time in which we remember the birth of Christ. But the greater day than that even is the day in which he rose from the dead. The day in which he died and was buried and he was in the tomb for three days and he rose from the dead. The only one who's ever been able to do it, he rose from the dead. By himself. Nobody raised him from the dead. He raised himself from the dead. By his own strength and power, our Savior claims the greatest two days in the history of the world. When God came down to earth and lived as a man, was born as a baby, God incarnated into man's flesh, and he walked as a man in this earth. And then the day in which a man rose from the dead and proved himself to be God. Two of the greatest days. The resurrection day, we call it Easter. And so we celebrate that day and as the day in which he rose from the dead and the day of Christmas when we celebrate the coming of Christ. Now that's how we want to remember this day, a day of reverence. It is a day of reverence, a day to, be, to worship our Lord and Savior. And the second thing we want to avoid besides irreverence is uh, materialism. Materialism. We want to avoid materialism. You know, Jesus came... To this earth and you consider how he came. He could have come in a train of uh, cha golden chariots with trumpeters and he could have had a grand parade and he could have had lights and things from heaven but he had a delegation of angels that announced his birth in the field to a bunch of shepherds. He came. He could have come and he could have come in a golden chariot but he didn't. He came and he was laid in a manger. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he laid, they, they laid him in a manger. Look at verse 12. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. A manger, a feeding trough, where they put the animal's food. That's the sign. He's going to be laying in a manger. He did not come to, uh, to have lots of material things. He came as a baby, and he came in humility, and he came poor. You know, when he died, he lived 33 years, and he died, and he didn't own anything. He didn't have a house. He didn't have anything on his possession. He didn't have any money. He didn't have any uh, earthly possessions. All he had was a, a, a singular garment that he wore. He had something that, uh, that someone had sewn for him, and they didn't want to tear that garment, so they gambled for it because it was a, a, nice, a nice garment. And so that's all he had was one. He didn't have a change of clothes. Our Savior, he was poor. He had the riches of heaven, but he came, and he had nothing. He now had nowhere to lay his head. He had no house. It's so unlike the spirit of Christ to be to have materialism at this time of year. It's so unlike the spirit of Christ to be materialistic and to be worried about overspending on gifts that you can't afford. You know that's the that's the the, the press at this time of year is to go out and buy those gifts. You got to get the you got to get the best gifts. You got to get the latest gifts. You got to get the newest gifts for your kids because they deserve it and you can't afford it. And so what do you do? You take out a loan and you borrow against money you haven't even earned yet just to buy the biggest and the nicest gifts for your kids. And the world tells you that's what Christmas is all about. Giving, giving, giving. You've got to give, give, give. And it is good to give. You can't argue with that. It's good to give. And it's good to sacrifice. And it's good to give for your children. But it's far worse to participate in materialism to celebrate a humble, poor Savior. It's far worse to overspend and over and overstretch yourself and get stressed and fussed and feud about finances later when all of your troubles come after all of the materialism comes and rakes you over the coals and, and, and gives you such grief because you're spending money you can't, can't afford to make. All because you're trying to celebrate a poor, humble Savior who came with nothing to show you that you don't need it all. 
You don't need all these things. You don't need all the world. You need Christ. Amen. You need salvation. You need the, the, the mercy of heaven upon your life. You don't need all these worldly things. They will tie you to the earth and bind your heart to the earth so that your heart cannot be in heaven. So we need to be aware that materialism is a great part of Christmas. It's a great part of the worldly way to spend Christmas. Overspending on your Christmas gifts is pretentious. Pretentious. You know what pretentious means? Pretentious means you're doing something that really isn't you. Pretentious is when you put on really nice clothes and try to mingle with people who have more money than you. Pretentious is when you go rent a BMW so that you can pull up to the party in a really nice car. Because really, you've got a, a, a Kia at home. That's old. It needs a new time. But you go and you rent a nice car so that you look nice at the party. Pretentious. Pretentious when you try to put on a front so that you look good when you buy so many gifts and you can't afford them. You're being pretentious to your children. That's not you. You can't afford them. Tell your children, we don't have that much money. We can't afford these things. We have essentials we have to have. And teach them that it is okay to be poor, to not have. You know, when I was growing up, we had a black and white TV. You say, wow, you're old. No, everybody else had a color TV. But we had a black and white TV because we couldn't afford a black color TV. Then we got a color TV. And you know what? We watched that thing, and, and uh, when we got the color TV, uh, everybody else had something real new. It was really cool. It was called a VCR. Y'all ever heard of a VCR? It has tapes. You can watch movies. We didn't have any such thing. We didn't have it, and people would say, oh, we watched this movie. Well, you want to borrow it? And they say, oh, we don't have a VCR. And they laugh at us. We didn't have a VCR. You know why? We didn't have any money. I remember one year we got bikes for Christmas. That was a big year. But that, we didn't get big gifts for Christmas. We didn't have the money. We just didn't have that kind of money, and it's okay, and it didn't hurt us. But you know what my dad did? He worked hard every day. And my mom stayed home with the kids, and she, they, we didn't have a lot of money for that. They sent us to private school, and on one income, my dad was a carpenter, and he pastored uh, part-time at the church as well. And it was difficult. We didn't have a lot. And you know, we never had a new car. Every car we had until when I was in high school was given to us. We never could afford to buy one. People would give us a car. And so we didn't have a car payment because we didn't have a nice car. We didn't have a car to, to, to make a payment with. And so I'm just saying that to tell you that you don't have to have all these nice things to raise your children. But you do have to have all those nice things to raise your children in a pretentious way. And to teach them materialism. And to teach them that it's more important to have gifts than it is to have family. And that it's more important to have uh, lots of earthly things than it is to love the Lord Jesus. You have to have all this overspending. You have to stretch yourself. You have to get all that, all those big gifts if you want to ruin your kids. Because the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so what we do is we find that there is the, the latest game system. I can remember going to my friends' houses and playing a video game. You know, we didn't have, I never owned a video game system. We couldn't afford it. And my family wasn't rich either. They never bought us one, but all my friends had them. And, I was, I was always interested to go to their houses and play with their toys because they had such good toys. It was exciting. But, you know, you don't have to have those things to be happy. We, had, uh, we, we were happy. We were poor and we didn't really know it. We didn't have that much. We weren't dirt poor, but we, we, did, we did all right. We enjoyed ourselves. We had family. And the point is, if you're going to live with this worldly mindset, you'll teach your children to covet. To covet. I want that. And you know what all they'll say for Christmas is, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Why? Because they know that you'll buy it for them. And you won't be able to help it. And you'll spend your bonus, and you'll spend next week's paycheck, and you'll spend beyond that, and you'll rent and borrow, and uh, I, I mean, you'll, uh, you'll take out loans in order to give them this and that, whatever they point to in the store. And you'll teach them that it is okay to be materialistic. But it's not. It's not okay. So avoid that during Christmas time. One more thing to avoid during Christmas time, and that will be gluttony. Gluttony. You know what gluttony is? That's when you just pig out on your food and you eat and eat and eat. And you know, this time of year, people do have lots of goodies and there's lots of things to uh, there's lots of things to uh, eat this time of year and there's lots of things to have. But you know, the Bible says, "Let your moderation be known unto all men." Have some self-control this time of year. You know, some people are going to be having the um, the uh, Christmas party from work. And you're going to go, and there's going to be alcohol there. And people will start to drink. And you know what happens when people drink at the Christmas 
party, and that is they pretty much make a fool of themselves, and next thing you know, they're not even working there anymore because of the embarrassing things they did and said at the, trip, at, this, at the work Christmas party. And, you know, you need to be alert to the fact that you need to be in, in, have some self-control. Jesus did not come to set us free so we could live the party life and do whatever we wanted. He came to show us the way of salvation, and He showed us that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. We, we need to have self-control. We don't need to be defined by uh, overindulgence. It's not to say you can't enjoy your dinner, and you should. But uh, gluttony is when you just overdo it, and you know you overdo it, and you just keep on overdoing it, and you don't need to lead that life. Our Savior would not do that. Celebrating Christ. He came to deliver us from the power of sin and flesh, and therefore we ought to show the world that we are, uh, we are delivered from those things. Now those are some things to avoid, but let's talk about some things to be observed for Christmas. Let's look at verse 10 of our text. Some things to be observed. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. You know, this time of year, Christmas time, it's a time for the hearing of the gospel. I bring you good tidings of great joy. The angel came with a great message, the message never before heard on this earth. The Savior has come down from heaven and he is dwelling among us. Emmanuel, God with us. What a message. Oh, unbelievable message. They were, could hardly see the end. He said, now you got to go, and here's going to be the sign of the proof of it. And you got to go and check this out, and they have to go look to see this baby come from heaven. What an amazing thing. And so there is a, there's the hearing of the gospel. What an important thing to do this time of year, to hear the gospel. We need to listen to the gospel. You know, you need to sit down on Christmas Day. And before the presents get ripped open, hopefully your kids don't get up before you and start opening gifts. I hope that never happens in your house. Make sure you're in control of your Christmas tree and Christmas gifts, and make sure the kids don't get them. I've heard bad stories about that. But I want to tell you that you should sit down with your children on Christmas Day and make this a Christmas tradition. You open up your Bible, and you have a word of prayer. And you read to them the Christmas story from the Bible before you open the gifts and you get all into it because, you know, once you open the gifts, you'll never see, you won't see your children. They'll be playing with every gift that you've given to them and they won't be anywhere around to be seen. They'll be out front yard riding or they'll be out uh, shooting or whatever it is you did for them. Uh, so make sure you do this first. Before the gifts, before the celebration of uh, this exchange, you want to be sure that you let them hear the gospel. Let them hear the gospel. That's what this day is about. I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. It needs to be uh, a, a, a tradition in your home where you open up the Bible on Christmas Day and you open up here to the book of Luke or you open up to the book of Matthew and you read the story and you teach your children what it is that's going on. Make sure they know what Christmas is about. Make sure they know it's not about a tree or, or about a man who's going to bring you something or it's going to be about some, uh, some gift that you've gotten. It's about Jesus Christ. And that's what matters. If you cannot do this and teach them this, then you can't celebrate Christmas like a Christian. We need to make sure that they understand. We read that gospel story. Tell them the meaning. And then we need to explain the meaning to the children and enforce it that this is important and that Jesus Christ came for me and for you. Let's not, uh, let's also be sure, I want to point this out, sometimes Chris, this week, this year Christmas is on Friday. Sometimes Christmas is on Sunday. Oh no, what do you do Christmas is on Sunday? You got to, going to be able to go to church? How are you going to have Christmas and church at this, on the same day? What are you going to do? Are you going to open up gifts and then leave them all there? Listen, is Christmas about the gifts or is Christmas about Jesus Christ? If Christmas falls on Sunday, where should you go? You should go to church. Does that mean you can't have Christmas? No, but you need to tell all your family, we're not going to be available until after church, because we're going to church. You know, sometimes there are people only go to church on Christmas and Easter. And for what that's worth, that's their, that's their um, that they feel like they, they need to. But you should go to church every Sunday. And then if it's Christmas, and Christmas falls on Sunday, don't take the day off of Jesus so that you can celebrate his day. Does that make any sense? But you're going to celebrate Christmas by taking the day off of church because it's interfering with your family plans? That doesn't make any sense at all. It's the day for Christ. So if it falls on Sunday, be sure to be in church. And arrange your Christmas day around it. So that when you open up your presents with your family, what should you do? Well, get up a little earlier. 
make sure you're ready, have your gifts, and then uh, exchange them, whatever, and tell the kids, okay, kids, put the toys down, we're going to church. And when they hear you say that, you know what they're going to realize? Jesus is more important than the gifts. Amen. Jesus is more important than the gifts, but when they hear you say, well, we're not going to church today because we have to go to Grandma's house and open up more gifts. Where do they hear you say that? The gifts are more important than Jesus. So you have to establish it for yourself. Tell your family, we'll be available after lunch. And then you can go visit with them and have your Christmas opening gifts then. They'll be okay with it. They'll understand. It's Christmas, you should be in church if it falls on Sunday. And then we want to remember his humility. Look in verse 12. And this shall be a sign to you, and you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. You know, we need to observe his, the hearing of the gospel. And we need to re remember his low condition. He, was, he came from heaven, and he came to give up all his comfort and be sacrificed. And he received nothing in this earth. He owned nothing, as we said. He humbled himself. And as we, we spoke of last week, he humbled himself, or two weeks back now, he humbled himself as a little child. But he said uh, that if, unless you humble yourself and become as a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But we need to remember his humility and his low condition. And be careful this time of year because people will get you all excited and worked up because sometimes this year is pretty stressful. You got a lot of things to get accomplished and all these gifts to purchase and food to cook and people to arrange and, and parties to get to. And it can be very unsettling. Sometimes Christmas is just an exhausting process to get to. Some like people like Christmas because everything's over when you're done. But uh, this is, we need to remember that Jesus had such a low condition. He was such a, a humble uh, person as he came to earth. God showed us what it's like to be humble. And we need to remember these things as he's, they're born in the manger. Let's look at verse 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. You know, once you've seen the gospel, once you've seen Jesus Christ for yourself, and you know that, it come, that salvation comes through Christ, the first thing that the shepherds did is they began to tell other people about it. And what better thing to tell at Christmas time than to tell somebody about what happened to you, how you met the Lord Jesus. And how you got saved. Now you're going to see family you haven't seen in a while. You're going to have, uh, a, a, you're going to have dinner at uh, your aunt's house. Or you're going to have dinner at your mom and dad's house or something. And you're going to see family members that you haven't seen in a long time. Maybe weeks or months or even years. And what better thing to do than like the shepherds tell them, listen, let me tell you what happened to me since I saw you last. Why, well, I, I started going to church. And that's about the time when I said, mm-hmm, where's this going? And then he tell them, look, but something great happened to me. I had a real burden in my heart, and, and the Lord helped me, and I found Christ, and I'm saved, and I'm on my way to heaven, and I, I want to tell you that what I found in Christ, the shepherds began to tell abroad all that they had seen. They began to tell it abroad, and they began to converse about Jesus. As soon as they met Him, the first thing they did is their heart filled with joy, and they wanted to tell somebody, and that's what happens to you when you get saved. You have this joy in your heart. I found Christ. I know now what happens to me when I am going to die. I, I have comfort. I found Jesus. And therefore, I'm going to go tell my friends, my family. It doesn't mean that you have to take over the Christmas get-together and, and you have to make, I have to preach a sermon and interrupt everybody and make sure that they listen only to you. But it does mean that you need to tell your friends and your family about Christ. And it does mean that this is the good time of year for them. Tell people it's glad tidings of great joy. But let's also look in uh, verse 20. It says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. You know, this is a time of year to glorify and to praise God. It's a time of year to glorify and to praise God. You ought to be able to sing to Him. You ought to be able to sing to Him. When you have Christmas, you ought to make sure the gospel is preached to your children, to your family, and in your home. There ought to be a time of uh, reading the scriptures and going through the gospel story. But then they, after they saw this and they, they wondered on it, what happened to them next? They began to praise God and to sing. And how can you not get excited and sing song or praise the Lord after you think that the God of heaven came down and he came into the world to save sinners? And not only did he come into the world to save sinners, but he died for me. I found that cross for me. Um, how can you not praise God for that? 
How can you not consider that these are wonderful things that have happened and begin to sing and to praise Him? And when you have your Bible time there around your Christmas uh, for your, before you have your presents and you read the Bible story and you reinforce to your children the value and importance of Christmas, you ought to sing a song. You ought to stop and sing Joy to the World or Away in a Manger or, uh, or, or one of the other songs that we sang, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You know, get out a, a hymnal. And, you know, their internet's so available now, anybody can get the lyrics uh, easy. You can't say, well, I don't have any songs around. And you know the tune. We've been singing them in church every week. We've been singing about Christmas songs. And, and so, you know the tune. You can sing a, a, a Christmas song around your tree and you can worship the Lord. You ought to stop and you ought to worship Christ. How can you not stop and sing praise to the Lord? Just like the shepherds did when they considered the beauty of the Lord Jesus coming to earth. They glorified God and they praised Him. It's a time for joy. You know, they say, what is the, you always see the hope and joy and love. And you see them in red and green around on people's lawns and hanging them streamers. This is a time for joy. It's a time of great joy. We bring you good tidings of great joy, glad tidings of great joy. Why so much joy? Because the Savior came, and He came for me, and He came for you. Of course, we're going to give gifts this time of year, but this day is not about gifts. And of course, we're going to see our family this time of year. We're going to see loved ones, but this day is not about loved ones. We are going to see our family. We're going to we're going to exchange gifts, and, and we're going to think about our blessings. And we say, oh, the Lord's blessed me this time of year. But this day is not about the blessings. This day is about the fact that the Savior came to earth. Amen. This day is a day of the, of the truth, that because Jesus came to earth, you do not have to die and go to hell. That is the case. We recognize that these things are true about this day. It's not about all those things. It's about Jesus coming. And if you can't keep that straight, then you won't be able to celebrate this day like a Christian. We're celebrating a very wonderful day. We ought to always praise Him. We ought to just praise Him all the time. We ought to have a song in our heart for the Lord. But on Christmas Day, we ought to have a special song just for the Lord on Christmas Day. Just take that time when you read your scriptures, when you tell the story of Christmas, to sing a song and sing with your children and teach them Christmas is important and Christmas is about Christ. Now our last point today is that we ought to give gifts on Christmas time. We ought to give gifts. You know, we, we say, well, it's not about the gifts, but I think we should give gifts at Christmas time. And you say, well, why, why do you say that? Well, the wise men gave gifts at Christmas. And that's where we get this idea from. The wise men came and they gave gifts. They gave gold and frankincense and myrrh. They gave gifts at Christmas. So we ought to give gifts. The wise men did it. And to whom did they give those gifts? Did they give them to each other? No, they gave them to Christ. They gave them to Christ. They gave them to Him. He is the proper object of all of our giving. Jesus is the, the one that we ought to give them to. So when you give gifts to your family, to your friends, make sure that you can offer that up to the Lord first. That's why you don't want to go into um, all that materialism. You can't offer materialism up to God. You can't ask God to bless your giving when you're doing it all for yourself and on selfishness and, well, the pressure of buying and we got to get this and we got to get that. You can't give that up to God. You can't do it to the glory of God. You ought to be able to give your gifts up to God first and then to your family. But God, He gave a wonderful gift as well. Turn to, with me over one book from the book of Luke to John chapter 3. The wise men gave gifts. The Father gave a gift as well on Christmas Day. Look what it says here in John chapter 3. And it says this in verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, it starts, For God so loved the world that He gave. He gave. Jesus was given to us. He's a gift from the Father to us. It is a gift. We speak of salvation as being the gift of God. Jesus is that gift. Jesus is given to us by the Father. He gave His Son. And if He gave us His Son so that we would be saved from the, the judgment of hell and saved from the condemnation of our sins, how will He not with Him freely give us all things? He is a giving God. He is a giver. 
He gave His Son. He'll give you all things necessary for life and godliness in His Son. He will give, and He will give, and He will give, and He will provide for you. He will bless you in the name of Christ. You will have gifts beyond your understanding. Jesus is the incarnation of God. That means He came in the flesh. His name, Emmanuel, means God with us. He is God dwelling with us. He gave. He loves us. And He gave to us. And He loves us. And therefore we love Him. And this giving has gone on at Christmas as a time to celebrate. It's good to give gifts at Christmas. You should give gifts at Christmas. You should recognize it and it should be a gift time of giving because men celebrate when good things happen. You know, if you were to, um, if somebody was to give you a gift at Christmas and it was a, a lottery ticket. You know, sometimes you'll buy lottery tickets and they give them as Christmas gifts. And if you win the lottery like that, you get to keep the money because you didn't play the lottery. You just got the gift. And so you don't have to feel any guilt about playing the lottery. There you are, playing, have given somebody, gave you a gift, and it happened to be a winning ticket. And, and what are you going to do if you find out? You, I don't know how you would, you scratch it off or something, and, and you won. And you won a whole bunch of money. Well, what do you do? You get excited, and, and you know, people say, well, if I won the lottery, this is what I would do. And they, they, oftentimes they'll say, well, I'd help this person, I'd help this family member, and I'd pay off this thing for this. And what are they doing? They're celebrating by giving gifts. When you get excited, when good things happen, if you can, you give gifts, right? If something good happens to you and you're blessed, what do you do? You oftentimes you give gifts, and that's what we're doing at Christmas time. We should give gifts. We just have to be careful not to let the materialism dictate how we give gifts. Not to let the world tell us what gifts you have to purchase or what things are necessary for you to buy when you know you can't afford them. So we're giving gifts. The Lord gave gifts. He could give, and He did give. And so we thank Him for it. He gave His Son, and He gave us life. Now, what do you have to give? What is it that you have to give that you can give back to God? God has given you His Son. He gave His only begotten Son. His Son that He, uh, that he loved. And He gave Him to you as a gift. And a free gift so that you could receive life. And having given you that gift, He says now to you, what do you have to give? What is it that you have that you can give back to God? Well, you know, you might say, well, I can try really hard to be a good person. But you know, God didn't ask you for that. He didn't ask you for your effort and for your work. He didn't ask you for your works. In fact, the Bible says to him who does not work but believes, um, him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Not by works which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. He didn't ask you for your work, so he, you can't give that to him. He didn't ask for that for Christmas. He didn't ask you for your work. You can try really hard to be a Christian, but it will never happen. You can't be a Christian by trying hard. So he doesn't want your work. And you say, well, I'll give him my money. I'll give, up all, I'll give my money up to him. Well, he doesn't want your money. You know, he wants you to give to the church, and that's normal that you would give to the church, but that won't buy you anything. You can't give your gifts up to God and get anywhere with Him. What is it that you can give to God that He wants? What it is that He wants is He wants your heart. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, My son, give me thy heart. That's what He wants. He wants your heart. Well, why does He want your heart? Why is it that that is all that He wants? First of all, it's all He wants because that's all you have to offer. Your things that you have, where did you get your money? Well, God gave it to you. You can't buy anything with it. It's His. When you say, well, I'll, I'll give Him my work. Well, where did you get your strength and your energy? God gives it to you. If it's going to be any good, it's because He gave it to you. So you can't use that to earn anything with God. But all you have is you. You have nothing to offer God, but you have yourself. And you can say to God, God, I have nothing to wait, make you happy with. I have nothing to please you with. I have nothing I can do to make you uh, accept me. But I can receive Christ into my heart. I can accept Jesus and love you. And I can serve you. And I can give you my heart. If he gets your heart, what does he get? Well, if he gets your heart, he gets all your behavior. Right? Because now your heart's in it. If he gets your heart, he'll get your love because your heart will be in it. If he gets your heart, he'll get all your money because your heart's in it. And he's not going to come and confiscate it. What it means is you'll say, all I have is his. He has my heart. If he has your heart, he'll have all your relationships. You'll want to please him in all your relationships. 
whether it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend, whether it's a husband or a wife or men to, uh, to their children, wives to their children, uh, family members, all these relationships, you're going to want to please Him in them. You're going to want to please and honor the Lord because He has your heart. When He has your heart, the proof of it is you want to please Him in everything you do in all your relationships. If He has your heart, He'll have all of your Christmas time. He'll have your Christmas. He'll have your worship. He'll have your, your, your affection. That's what He wants, your heart. If you can give Him your heart, then He gives all, he gives all of you. That's all there is of you. Once He has your heart, He's got you. And that's what He wants for Christmas. You say, what, what, what am I going to get stones over Christmas? What, what's on their Christmas list? And so you call up your family and say, what do your kids want for Christmas? And you start asking these questions. Then you go shopping with your list. And you, you go into the store and you say, okay, i got to buy for this person and that person. And these are all the things that they want for Christmas. And then you give it to them and they say, oh, my mom got me the same thing. And you're like, oh, got the same thing for the kid that they already got. And then you end up giving them the same gift. What's on Jesus' Christmas list? Just you. Just your heart. Just that you would give yourself to God. So that you can say to the Lord Jesus, I love you. And I want to please you. And I want you to be honored and glorified in how I live my life. In the words that come out of my mouth. The spirit in which I conduct myself. I want you to be happy with how I wake up in the morning and how I live and how I go to sleep at night. I want you to be pleased. I want that in my life. Now, when you, when you fall and you fail and you don't live up to it, what do you say? Well, he has your heart, so what do you do? You say, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And for Jesus' sake, forgive me. And I want to do right. And you get things right with God. He asks him to forgive you and you live for him. Because God wants your heart. That's his Christmas gift that he wants for you. That's all he has on this Christmas list is your heart. He wants you to repent, turn to God, and love Him and live for Him. That's all there is. So, do we believe in giving gifts at Christmas time? Sure, give gifts. But be sure you give Jesus your heart. That's the most important thing. Does He have your heart today? Do you love Him? And do you want to serve Him? And does the, your character of your life reflect that? Do you, are you able to say, the way that I live my life this week is, shows that I love Jesus? And when I didn't do it the way he wanted me to, I asked him to forgive me because I love him and I don't want to hurt him. And I want to please the Lord with my life. I want to get up in the morning and please him. I want to live all day to please him and I want to go to sleep having pleased him. Does that characterize your life that you've given your heart to the Lord and you want to please him? That is what God has said that he wants. Give me your heart. That's all he wants is your heart. Once he gets that, he gets all of you. So that's the message of Christmas. We need to have a reverence for Him. We need to make sure the gospel is preached in our homes and songs are sung to the Lord in our hearts and in our families. And we need to be sure we're avoiding the materialism and the worldly things that entice us. And we need to make sure we're giving gifts. And those gifts need to be our hearts given to Christ. Once our hearts are given to Christ, we will worship on Christmas like a true Christian. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us your life. And Lord, we want to, we want to honor that, not with our words only, not with our actions, not with just our things that we do, but with our hearts, so that our hearts can reflect that our Savior has come home and he has lived here in our hearts and he's making it a place that's comfortable for him. Be honored and glorified, Lord, with the way that we celebrate Christmas, first by having our hearts and then by having our behavior. God, I thank you for a wonderful time at Christmas. I pray that you would bless us, keep our families safe, and bless our homes this new year. And I pray, Lord, most of all, that if our children, any of our families in this church have children that are not saved, that this year that they would hear the gospel and believe. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.